Here we are in uh, inside the market on Larimer Square in Denver, Colorado, and there's just a few things I want you to notice. Uh, you can still see the blue and white awnings through the windows from in here, and the light coming through the windows and the doorway was an important part of the painting. Also, just the number of people sitting around having coffee, reading the newspaper, and so forth. And the hanging lights ended up in the painting, and these round tabletops, the wooden tabletops with the old coffee cups and so forth, uh, that's in the painting, and then the old uh, market wooden floor, and also just the clutter, all the stuff, the counters, the things that they have for sale, and all of that, ended up making a really interesting composition where I didn't have to make too many changes for the painting to work. So uh, now we'll go back in the studio and take a look at the painting. Here we are back in my studio and we're going to look at one of my paintings that I did of the market. And this is a more advanced lesson and by that I mean you should be painting for a while and you should have some understanding of things like colors, values, shapes, edges, borders, color temperature, and something I call artistic decisions, which I'll explain as we go along. Now, when I do a painting of a place like the market, I try to capture some of the things that are characteristic of the place, like the front entrance and the big windows and the blue and white awnings and inside the overhead lamps and the round tables and the funny chairs and mainly just the people that seem to be enjoying the place. So those are some of the things we're going to look for in the painting. Let's take a look. First I'll point out some of the things I just mentioned. Here's the entrance and the windows where the sunlight's coming in. And then here are the blue awnings, blue and white stripe awnings. These are the overhead lamps that I mentioned. Uh, the round cafe tables and these very strange chairs that I've never seen anywhere else where the back is actually shaped like a heart. Those are very characteristic of the market in downtown Denver. And then what I consider the most important thing is the people that seem to be enjoying themselves while they're in the market. And one of the most important things in this painting is the sunlight. And so that's why I chose this particular view because it means the figures, this one in particular, are backlit because the sun is kind of coming in behind him on, through the windows and the doorway. Now in terms of color, uh, the awnings up here, the stripe is cerulean blue and the white stripe is just the white of the paper and then the gray shadow shapes that are on the awnings is a mixture of cerulean blue and red and then in the man's suit the actually the darkest colors in the painting it's a combination of ultramarine blue and uh, burnt umber and i try not to stir my mixtures up too much just like i mentioned on the video in color mixing because I like to see little nuances of all the things that are in the mixture. Uh, the floor down here is raw sienna, and then the shadow shapes, the cast shadows on the floor, are just a darker version of raw sienna with a little bit of burnt sienna. The uh, area under the tables over here, this dark shadow area, again is a combination of a dark brown and a dark blue. And some of these areas over here are uh, burnt sienna and raw sienna and yellow ochre. Uh, there's a lot of different colors in all the clutter back here. And over here there's a mixture of gray which is uh, cobalt blue and yellow ochre. And then a lot of these colors in here are just right out of the tube, like different blues and yellows and reds. Now let's look at the painting uh, in accordance with the values. The 
main figure here that's slightly off center, the gentleman carrying the food tray, uh, his suit is the darkest value in the painting and he's framed by the lightest value in the painting, which is the open doorway, but in this case it's mainly just white paper. So we have the darkest value against the lightest value right here and that commands a lot of attention and sets this guy off as a little bit of a focal point. The same way with his white shirt. It's that white paper against that darkest value. And then uh, down here on the floor, the whole floor was painted with raw sienna in a very light value, this light struck area. And then when that was dry on top of it, I painted the cast shadows which are burnt sienna and uh, raw sienna mixed together. Just a darker value to put these shapes on here on top of the sunstruck area. The value under the tabletops over here is basically one shape, but the idea of that is to set these tabletops off so that they read correctly in the painting. Uh, some of the values in the clutter up here, all these different things on the shelves, I kept the values very close together. In other words, uh, there's no big jumps between light value and dark value. They're all light to middle values. And that makes even an area that's cluttered like this a little bit easier to read. And the same thing over here on this side. I, this area, the stand for these big containers here was as dark as anything in the building but I lightened the values a little bit so that they wouldn't command as much attention. In these areas like this I try to keep the values anywhere between light values and middle values. No big value changes, nothing really dark in value. If you look over here you can see how values create form and these objects, the coffee cups and glasses and papers that are on the tabletops. It just goes from white paper into a little bit darker value with a soft edge and that creates forms. In a painting, you have to remember that everything in the light, like this man's shoulder or these areas of the floor that are light struck, everything in the light has to be lighter than everything in shadow. And everything in shadow has to be darker than everything in the light. In other words, a light area like his white shirt, if it's in shadow, it has to be darker than everything that's in the light, like his shoulder over here. It's very subtle in some of these areas, but that's just something that, to remember that helps you deal with light and shadow. Now we're going to talk about shapes in this painting. And if you can learn to see shapes in your painting and use that when you're, when you're painting, it really helps you move forward. So this area right here, this darker area under the tabletops, that should read as one shape. In other words, there shouldn't be much value changes in there. Uh, that will simplify this area and make it easier to read. And if you look at it, that dark area even includes this man's pants over here. Uh, but all that comes in as one shape. In the main character over here, his suit, even though it's a jacket and pants and shoes, that still reads as one shape. And that keeps it simple. Over here in this area that's all cluttered, a lot of the things are pulled together, like right here. That is really just one shape. You can't tell what all the little objects are, but it simplifies that area. Same thing over here. In this area, you can see how a bunch of this junk is just piled up and painted as one shape, rather than each little individual object. If you learn to work with shapes, it cuts down the amount of details that you put into the painting keep some areas a little bit simpler and makes the whole thing easier to read. Now let's look at the edges in this painting. What you want in a painting is a good combination of hard and soft edges. 
If you look at this figure right here, the woman's hair comes down and blends into her sweater. That creates a soft edge right there. Again, a combination of hard and soft edges will make the painting work better. The areas that you want to play up the most, like this gentleman right here, you use harder edges. There's a nice hard edge right around him because he's backlit. Areas that you want to play down a little bit, you use softer edges. The way I've done in the figures over here and the plants up here and all this clutter in the background, some of these edges were allowed to bleed together while the paint was still wet and that creates some soft edges. If you look over here, there's a number of soft edges in combination with some harder edges so that that area works correctly. If you look up here in the awnings, these stripes, the blue and white stripes, they're not completely solid. They're broken up a little bit. That gives a little bit more of an effect of the sunlight coming through there. Uh, if you look down here on the floor, the edges, it's a way of creating soft edges because it's what I call a broken edge where it just kind of fractured along the edge here. There's more than one way to create a soft edge. One way is to break the edge up a little bit like this. The common way is to let the colors bleed together while they're both still damp. Now another way to create soft edges is to put values next to each other that are close together. Like her dark sweater against this dark shape creates a little bit of a soft edge right there against these hard edges on the tabletops. So it's just a nice combination of hard and soft edges in that area. Over here, uh, just because I played some of these values down a little bit, it softens some of these edges and there's a few hard edges in there as well. Up here in this cooler, you can see where there the white paper and this very light gray because they're so close in value that creates a soft edge and then there's some soft edges over here on the side if you look at uh, the gentleman here his shoes come down and soften right into the cast shadow so the shadow of his shoes being backlit just blends right into the shadow that is the cast shadow. And I like to have a soft edge as it transitions from the object and then into the cast shadow. It just makes everything read better. Now let's look at uh, the painting in terms of the how I use the white paper. In watercolor you're using white paper instead of white paint so you have to plan ahead. If you look at the open door behind the gentleman that's basically just white paper. There's a few little tiny shadow shapes to indicate some of the buildings across the street, but mainly it's just white paper. The same thing with the windows here and the front of this uh, glass that's on this cooler. That's all white paper. The newspaper that this gentleman is reading over here is just white paper. The objects on the tabletops, coffee cups and glasses and paper. That's white paper, but I've used a little bit of color in it to give it some form. Now on the chairs, uh, this shape back here on the back of the chairs, you can leave white paper on that, but it's pretty difficult to paint around something like that. So I either lifted it out to get it back to pretty much the white paper, and by doing that, I just use the tip of the brush and paint a water line on there and then blot it with a tissue and to lift out some of that color. And I use non-staining colors, so that works. But you can also just use a little bit of, of uh, white watercolor paint, like zinc white, and just paint little things like that. Sometimes that's easier than trying to paint around something that's that complicated. Uh, now let's see where else have I used white paper. There's some up here in the clutter 
you can see uh, white paper and it softens into a lighter value, just a little bit of a shadow shape. There's one other thing I want to mention about the effective use of white paper, and that's the awnings up here. The white stripes in the awnings are just white paper, but I put a little bit of a shadow shape in there to create the idea of the light coming through that. I didn't want it to be as bright white as like the windows down here or the open doorway. When you're working in watercolor, you have to plan ahead where the white is going to be in the painting and plan on leaving just white paper for that. It's kind of like a chess game where you have to plan your moves ahead of time. Now we're going to talk about something that I call artistic decisions. Uh, each artist, when they're doing a painting, is going to make certain decisions just that they decide on that changes some of the things they're looking at, but turns it into more of a work of art. An example of that is the placement of this figure. It's the main figure in the painting. It's a little bit off-center, so it's not right in the middle like a target. But also, this door frame right here kind of frames that figure and makes it even more important. Then you have the darkest dark against the lightest light. That also commands some attention. Another decision I made, and I often do this when I'm doing figures in a painting like this, there's no features on the face, the faces of the figures. It's just their hair and the shape of their head and then the clothing. If I put eyes, nose, and mouth on each of these figures, it just becomes too cluttered in my opinion and it's too much detail and I don't need that. Particularly on these figures like over here, which are not the main part of the painting anyway. Uh, if I have the gesture right, like in this gentleman, if the gesture looks right and a little tilt to his head, then I deliberately leave out the eyes, nose, and the mouth because I think that just makes the painting too cluttered. Another decision is the lighting. I chose to have backlighting. I could have painted this painting in the market from any other place inside the market, but I like this because the light coming through here was backlighting and simplified some of these shapes, like the main character. There's so many things to think about when you're painting. In this case, I worked with colors, values, shapes, edges, white paper, borders, artistic decisions. These are all the things that I considered and thought about when I was working on this painting. I hope this video gives you things to think about that will improve your paintings. And until next time, this is artist Dennis Pendleton saying, keep on painting.